wait for the video. Good morning, everybody. It's Nurse Adrian. I'm back with another class today. So today's class is going to be primarily general breastfeeding questions. But I also want to open it up to any other concerns or questions you might have just in general regarding your postpartum recovery. Um, I do postpartum here at Southern Hills Hospital, and I'm very accustomed to doing the teaching when we get you guys ready to go home. But when you get ready to go home, there can be a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of distractors at that time. So once you get home and the dust clears and things are kind of settling in, then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I needed to ask her about this, or what about that? I can't remember what my nurse said. So I'll be taking those questions as well. Um, but let's start um, by doing just a little uh, q and I want you guys to feel free to start posting your questions, and we're going to answer them in real time as best we can. Uh, if we have any tech issues, just bear with us. Uh, hopefully, things will run smoothly. But if you guys are having trouble hearing or seeing anything like that, put it in the comments so that we can address it as soon as we can, OK? All right, let's get started. So if you delivered here at Southern Hills Hospital and you're breastfeeding, I'm hoping that you went home with this book. So I'll be referencing this book quite a bit. So if you have it handy, I would grab it or jot down some notes. Or if you're more of a tech savvy person, just start a notes uh, page in your phone so that you can refer back to it, OK? This is the book that we give everyone who delivers here when they're breastfeeding. And it covers a lot of the information and concerns that you would have in the first you know, four to six weeks or so. So um, fire away, fire away. I'm here to answer your questions. And I'll just wait to hear from you guys. Thanks for joining us, too. So one, on the book, it, oh, okay, great. We have a question. Hi, Melissa. Yes, Melissa says, uh, she watched last week. Um, what do you suggest for women with hormone issues that make it difficult to nurse? Mm. So Melissa's wondering about hormone issues that might make it difficult to nurse. Um, to start with, I would probably need a little more information. What hormones are you talking about? If you're talking about uh, your breastfeeding hormones, um, the best way to address that if you're struggling with supply issues is to increase the demand that's placed on your milk ducts. When you're breastfeeding, there's two hormones that you need to ensure that you have a sufficient supply for your baby. One is oxytocin, and that triggers the reflex to send the milk out to the baby. It triggers that letdown reflex that you've heard about. PCOS specifically. OK, I see your, your caveat there. So PCOS. OK, let me finish my train of thought, and then we'll get to PCOS. The other hormone that you need uh, is prolactin, and that tells your body to make the milk in the first place. So. Because PCOS is such a multifaceted concern, what I would suggest you do, along with making sure that your baby's eating at the breast at least eight times every 24 hours, or at minimum you're pumping at least that frequency, I would um, take that question back to your physician, uh, your care provider, let them know what your concerns are, and go from there, just because I don't want to interfere with any type of medications that you might need to take. So. I don't want to get too specific, but I'm hoping that answers your question, Melissa. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for your question. Jamie would like to know, what do you do for a clogged duct or multiple clogged ducts? How do you prevent it? What do you do for the pain? When mm. should you go to the doctor because of it? Hi, Jamie. So Jamie's got kind of a, a she's got a question about plug ducts and what to do about them, how to prevent them, and when should you seek medical advice. So a plug duct often crops up. Uh, because the breast isn't being emptied sufficiently. So you want to be sure that when your baby's at the breast that you feel a difference in the density of it before and after. It should feel on the full side before feeding, and it should feel noticeably softer after. Um, a good thing to do while you're feeding, if your baby's otherwise latched well, if you can kind of feel where that plug duct is, you can gently massage. If you're feeding on the left side, let me show you with a doll. 
So if you're feeding, let's say, on the right side, and you've got your baby latched well, you're in cross cradle position like this, you're gonna be using this hand to support your breast. So I'm gonna move my badge out of the way. You're gonna support your breast like this, and if the, the plug duct is up in here somewhere, you can use your thumb to gently massage and think of um, pressure with a forward motion. So pressing down and then forward. Not so much that you're hurting yourself, but that will encourage that duct to drain. The other thing that you can do if your baby hasn't uh, latched well or if it was a briefer feeding is you can always pump right after a feeding for about 10 minutes or so. Um, watch the flow of the milk and as long as it's continuing to flow, you can continue to pump. But after after about 20 minutes, I would hold off. Um, that would be a good time to stop unless you experience another letdown and then you can keep going. The only thing you want to do with pumping is you want to be sure that you don't start pumping too much and get yourself into an oversupply situation. So um, other things to do with plug ducts along with making sure the breast is empty is to use some uh, warm compresses, so some warm moist heat and gentle massage like I talked about before. And if the pain becomes um, so much that it's difficult for you to feed, it's painful to have the baby latched, especially if you feel like you're running a fever or you're feeling like you're getting the flu and you see a red spot where that sore area is, that's when you want to call your doctor as soon as you see those symptoms because it could develop into mastitis and the fix for that is antibiotics. You want to be sure that you get those antibiotics on board as soon as possible so that you can get relief, okay? Hi, Darlene. Thanks for your question. So she's wondering, she's breastfeeding about every two hours, is that correct? And then she's wondering about incorporating pumping. So um, I have a question, I guess, back to you then, Darlene, is are you going to be at home for a while or are you going to be going back to work? Because there's a couple different approaches. So I guess I'll answer both approaches. I'll, I'll give you tips for both and then we can go from there. So if you're at home, Let's say um, your baby's maybe four weeks old. That's a good time to start introducing the pump. That gives you sufficient time to get your supply well established and it helps you to really become familiar with your baby's feeding cues and you really can get comfortable with your body signals. You know when you're full and when it's time to feed so that if... Darlene, stay at home. Okay, perfect. Darlene, you stay at home. So then I'll just cater the, or tailor the, the answer to that. So, going back, so your, your baby's latching well, you're comfortable with supply, and everything is pretty much clicking along. What you can do is start incorporating a pumping session first thing in the morning, right after that first morning feed. So let's say your baby wakes up around six in the morning. Go ahead and feed your baby on both sides if he or she wants to. And then as soon as you finish that feeding, you can pump right then for about 10 minutes. The reason for that is that early in the morning, that's when your breasts are going to be most full, number one. And number two, your breastfeeding hormones are going to be at their highest levels in your bloodstream. So you want to take advantage of that. Pump for about 10 minutes. And I would suggest that you pump right into one of the breast milk storage bags. That'll save you some time transferring from the cylinder to the bag and it's a little more um, efficient and then just put that milk right in the freezer and just like with the dairy case at the grocery store you want to put the freshest or the most recently pumped milk to the back and then it comes forward so when you need to uh, if you leave the house and someone else is going to feed your baby they're going to pull a packet of frozen milk right from the front rather than from the back that makes sense right so you can continue to pump first thing in the morning for about 10 minutes and then um, just as you feel the need to. So the nice thing about being at home with your baby is that when our lives return back to normal uh, and you're able to go out with your baby, you've got everything you need with you so you really don't need very much in your diaper bag and you can just feed your baby at the breast wherever you are. Now that brings up another 
concern that a lot of women have, and that's breastfeeding in public. Um, this country is becoming a little bit more breastfeeding friendly. We're a little more accustomed to it now. More women are doing it, and so it's not as much of a thing. You know, it's, it's not something, it's not as much of an outlier type of behavior. More women are doing it, so you may not feel the stigma that women say maybe 20, 30 years ago would have felt. So when you're out breastfeeding in public, it's a good idea to you know, bring some things that will help you to feel comfortable, depending on your level of modesty. Um, there's um, special capes that you can get that would cover you, but they have like a stiff ring right here so you can look down and see that your baby's latched well. But a lot of babies don't like that particular setup because it can make them too hot, and especially with summer coming up, it might make you too warm as well. So. It's not a bad idea to maybe, if you're comfortable with this, you know, start with in your backyard or on your deck if it's, you know, not during the super sunny time of day. But get used to being outdoors, doing it outdoors, and then maybe move to your backyard or to your, you know, to a park, something like that. Uh, and then as stores begin opening and we get to go out and be out in public, there are a lot of retailers in town that have a special place for moms that are breastfeeding and you can do it in public but also in a private safe space that's dedicated to that if that makes sense we have any more questions? Are you ready? okay yeah okay, let's so take next question Nikki, Nikki has a one -month -old and, hi Nikki um, uh, the baby doesn't have a feeding schedule she can eat every half an hour or two mm -hmm. it just depends if she's sleeping is this normal when should she get on a schedule and how long should she be feeding each time Okay, so Nikki's question is about her one-month-old who isn't really on a feeding schedule. That's totally fine. Um, you want to feed on demand and use your baby as your guide. Uh, if she's hungry, she'll tell you, or he. Um, if the baby is, you know, if the baby's been sleeping for a couple of hours and you're starting to feel kind of full, you can wake the baby up gently start changing the diaper, put your baby skin to skin, and just let them gently wake up that way. But I'm not a big proponent, personally, of putting a newborn like that on a schedule, simply because they're not quite ready for that yet. The, the schedule will kind of emerge and evolve as the weeks and months go by. Um, as your baby gets more accustomed to life outside the womb, you'll start to see feeding patterns emerge and behavior patterns. You'll notice that your baby's more hungry at a particular time of day and maybe not as interested at another time of day. Um, while you don't want to necessarily try to impose a schedule at this point, you can start to incorporate a routine so that your baby gets accustomed to certain things happening at certain times of day. S um, start with bedtime. You might start putting your baby, you know, getting them ready for bed at say eight o'clock at night. You do a bath and then you do a feeding, and then you have them in, a, you're in a special room, maybe in their nursery with low lighting and special music, and you can incorporate all of that into the bedtime routine. But I wouldn't focus too much on putting them on a feeding schedule yet. Now, as far as the length of time of feedings, that can vary as well. Some babies are really hungry first thing in the morning, and you might find that you're feeding to up to half an hour at a time in the morning, whereas in the afternoon they might be feeding maybe 10 or 15 minutes. That's okay. What you want to look at, don't, don't focus too much on the length of feedings, but you want to look at your baby's output. So I'm talking about the diapers, so you want at least you know five or six minimum wet diapers every 24 hours, and you want anywhere from three to four poopy diapers in a day up to one with every feeding. There's a, a range of normal, and as long as your baby is making sufficient wet and poopy diapers and the pediatrician is comfortable with their progress as far as their growth and their weight, then you're doing everything right. Um, Darlene wants to know, should she be feeding on both sides? She kind of did this with her first, but mm -hmm. Right, that's a good question, Darlene. And you're you're right. Things can be different each with each successive baby. That was my experience as well. Um, if your baby is hungry and you fed, say, 15 minutes on the left side, 
and it feels noticeably less full, then you can absolutely put your baby on the right side. And it's also okay to go back and forth a few times. You may find that um, your baby wants to do this um, for a day or two, and if you're noticing that pattern, they're probably in the middle of a growth spurt. So the best thing you can do is feed on demand. If your baby's hungry, put them to the breast, and then that growth spurt takes you know a couple of days. What your baby's doing is getting your milk ducts regulated to their increased demand. So as the demand increases, your milk supply will increase in a corresponding way. So that's a good thing to keep in mind if you're concerned about your supply. Be sure that your baby's at the breast at least eight times, but up to 12 times or more in, the, for, in every 24 hour period and be sure that they're emptying the breast well. So Jamie says, um, Hi Jamie. How often should my baby be nursing? Mine is six weeks tomorrow and she will nurse every 45 minutes to hour, hour and a half. Is that normal? Mm -hmm. Also, how long is a good amount of time should she be eating? Again, she nurses anywhere from five to 40 minutes every time. Okay, so Jamie's question is about how long the feeding should last and how often these feedings should happen. So what I tell my patients a lot in the hospital is try not to live and die by the clock. That being said, you want to make sure that your baby is feeding at least eight times up to 12 times every 24 hour period. Now that works out to about every two to three hours, but there's a lot of room for flexibility uh, within those guidelines. Um, for a six week old, it may be that your baby's going through a growth spurt. I'm gonna put my doll down. It may be that your baby's going through a growth spurt and that's okay. Um, it can seem during those times that you're feeding all the time. And that's a common experience, but just know that those periods don't last. Um, with regard to the length of time spent at each breast, really 30 minutes is plenty of time. So when your baby's at the breast, you wanna be sure that your baby's actively, nutritively sucking is what we call it. So you feel tug and pull back here, either on top or underneath, a little back from the nipple. You should also feel no pain on your nipple itself and your breast should feel softer after a feeding. Another way to tell if it's been a good feeding and your baby's been at that particular breast uh, for a sufficient amount of time is look at your baby's behaviors after the feeding and then compare them to how your baby was behaving before. If your baby was active, moving, putting hands to mouth, licking and smacking and looking for the breast, rooting, you know, like that, and now that you're done with the feeding, say after 20 or 25 minutes, your baby's like, that's a good feeding. Also, think about how you feel too, because this is one way to know if your body's on track and you're producing well. After a feeding, after a good feeding, most moms feel sleepy, drowsy, they're ready to take a nap, and that's a very good sign because that means that your prolactin levels are high enough in your bloodstream, your body's gonna be making enough milk for your baby, and prolactin makes us sleepy. So that biological mechanism is there in place for a reason. So this is my one of my little soap boxes I'm gonna get on now. One of the best pieces of advice that I was given as a new mom that I never took was to sleep when my baby was sleeping. And it is really challenging for those of us who are more of a type A personality. If you're used to getting up and doing things and it's very important that you have an organized and neat and tidy home like it was for me at that time, that can be kind of a struggle to just relax. But it's okay. This time in your life is only gonna be for a short period of time, it's temporary, and you'll be able to get back to those things and get back to that routine. But this is a good time for all of us to remember that it's okay to kind of unclench a little bit, let some of those things go, because no mom that I've ever talked to um, as a patient who's back with ha you know, having her second, third, fourth, fifth baby, uh, maybe it's a mom that's been coming to support group for a while and now she's back at work. I've never heard a mom ever say to me, gosh, I wish I had done the dishes more often. I wish I had stayed on top of my laundry. <laughs> Nobody ever says that. Um, but what they do 
sometimes feel bad about, and I felt this way too, is I wish I'd had more time. I wish I could go back and tell my 32-year-old self who was at home with her third baby, it's okay, relax. You're going to have dirty dishes and you're going to have dirty laundry for the rest of your natural life. They will always be there with you, those things. But your children are only going to be this little and this small for such a short period of time. That's something I would, have, I would like to remind myself of. So when you feel a little overwhelmed and you see that the dishes are piling up, you know, maybe you've got someone at home that can help you out and be a support to you that way. Um, some of us don't care. Some of us are just, you know, it's fine. I'll get to the dishes when I get to them. I'm feeding my baby right now, and that's great. I applaud those of you who can do that. I wish I could have. <laughs> So kudos to you, you're doing it right. You're, and not that our type A folks, you know, not that we're not doing it right. There's room for all those personalities in the world. But those of us who tend to be a little bit more regimented and a little bit more comfortable with the schedule, just know that during this time, it's okay to relax a little bit. When you're breastfeeding and you're finished feeding, if, you bo if your body's telling you that you need to go to sleep, listen to your body. That's just good advice in general, no matter what the health concern is. Okay, I think we've got another question. Jamie says, I think my baby has a lip tie. Can this interfere with her latch? And how do you know if it is a good latch? Mm -hmm. I think she has a good latch, and I know she's getting milk, but I've heard lip ties can be bad. Hi, Jamie. So Jamie's got a question about lip tie, and she's concerned that her baby might have that. Um, sometimes they can interfere with breastfeeding, but not always doesn't always, you know, create a problem. Um, what you want to look at is how do your breasts, how does your nipple especially look before and after a feeding? If the shape is essentially the same, but maybe your nipple is just a little more averted after a feeding and the feeding itself is comfortable, you're not experiencing any pain while you're feeding, and your baby's gaining weight and doing all the things that they're supposed to be doing, then I think it's okay for now to not let that be too concerning for you. But if this is something that you're concerned about, um, it's always okay to talk to the pediatrician about that. So when you take your baby back to the next appointment, mention that to them and then let them know feedings are going well, I'm comfortable, and ask them about the baby's weight gain, if they're on track and they're meeting their milestones. If your pediatrician is concerned, then they would be the ones to talk about interventions. But if you're otherwise comfortable and your baby's feeding well and you feel like you have a good supply, then I don't think lip tie should really be a concern for you. It's just something to keep in the back of your mind, be aware of later on. Thanks for your question. All right, so another common question that uh, we get at support group is how long can I store my breast milk? How long is it good? And if I leave it sitting out, is that okay? So what I'm gonna do now is reference our book. So if you have this book nearby, you can turn to page 42. Um, it looks like this, or just jot it down or take a little voice to text note for yourself so that you can refer to it later. So I'm going to give you the place at which it's stored, the room temperature or the temperature of the storage facility and then how long it can stay there. And then there's with each different type of storage place there's just some things to know. So if you've just pumped breast milk and you think your baby's probably going to want to eat that milk, have that milk soon, or you're needing to bump up your supply and get your baby to feed more, you can keep pumped breast milk at room temperature for four hours, okay? And that's, I would pump it into a container and put it in a safe place, maybe a kitchen counter, someplace where it's not going to get bumped or knocked over, someplace where it's safe. Four hours is best, and you want to be sure, it says right here, containers should be covered and kept as cool as possible. Um, you can cover it with a clean, cool towel to help keep it colder. Uh, but after the baby's finished eating that freshly pumped milk, you want to toss it, you know, basically right after. And what we're concerned about there is bacterial growth. 
Um, and I, I'll pause right here. It looks like we have another question. It's about this. Okay. Um, Yes, Jamie. Hi, thanks for your question. So Jamie's wondering if you can mix milk that's been chilled with milk that you've just pumped. Yes, you can. You may want to warm it up a little bit. And if you don't have a milk warmer, um, I like to roll old school with this. Have some water that you've just boiled on the stove. Take it off the boil, turn the burner off, and then uh, just put the cold milk in there for just a little bit so that it warms up a little so that you're not giving your baby, you know, cool milk. Warm, warmed up to room temperature is perfectly fine. But yes, you can do that. You can combine as long as it's the milk that's been chilled has been in that refrigerator for 24 hours or less. If it's been longer, then you may want to think about f getting that milk into the freezer. Um, which brings me to the next topic. So when you're storing the milk in the freezer, up to three days is best. I encourage people to, after 24 hours, put it in the freezer. You want to put it in the back of the main body of your refrigerator. Now, for those of you who are pumping and you're going to be going back to work, if you have a refrigerator at work where you can store your pumped milk, you also want to place all of your expressed milk in the refrigerator, um, get a, an insulated bag of some kind, put it inside the bag, and put that bag to the back of the refrigerator. That's the coldest part. On the door is the warmest part. Now, if you're storing it right, if you're putting, if you're pumping and putting it right into the freezer, um, three to six months is best, and it depends on the type of freezer you have. So, um, freezer here would be referring to a side by side that's connected to your refrigerator, or maybe freezer on the bottom or freezer on the top. Three to six months is best, and you always want to store it toward the back of the freezer. And that's where the temperature is most constant, OK? When you're opening the freezer and closing it, stuff that's at the front tends to get warmer. It might start to thaw just a smidge. So if it's at the back, it's going to stay at a more constant temperature. And it looks like we have another question. Yes, so Darlene says, when should we start cold milk? I started late and had to keep warming our daughter's milk for a while. So she's trying to avoid that. Oh, OK, Dar Darlene's got a question about when should you, I, I think you want to know when should you start warming the milk? So I would, when should we start cold milk? oh, when should you start cold milk? So um, if you're talking about feeding your baby cold milk, I would talk to your pediatrician about that. It's my understanding that you want to give milk that's at room temperature. If you're talking about getting, taking cold milk out and getting it warmed, then I would say if you know your baby's going to eat about every three hours, probably 30 minutes prior to that is when you could start warming. Now, that being said, things change, things happen, and the best laid plans of mice and men can fall apart, you know, at a moment's notice, especially if you've got other children in the house. So just kind of keep that in your mind and maybe set a timer on your phone to take the cold milk out about 30 minutes prior. If you don't want to warm it and you just want to put it on the counter to come to room temperature, then I would say probably an hour ahead of time just to give it enough time to warm up. But if you're concerned, you can always, you know, put it under hot running water for a couple of minutes too. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so now freezer, now we're gonna talk about the deep freezer. So this is the kind of freezer, you can get these at Costco for about $150 and it's a big chest where you lift the top like a trunk. So in that type of storage environment, the milk is good for six months and again, you want to store it towards the back or at, in this particular case, if it's the type where you lift, then put it at the bottom because we know heat rises and cold air descends. So the bottom of the freezer in this type of storage situation is going to be the coldest place. And it's not a bad idea to have maybe a little container to keep things organized. And even then, when you've got it on a, in, a, in a little case in the bottom of the freezer, you still want to put the, the oldest to the front and the freshest to the back at the bottom. Um, I hope that makes everything clear. I hope that was easy to understand. If you guys want me to go over that stuff again in a little bit, I absolutely can do that. Just let me know in the comments. And I'm ready for the next question. Darlene was saying that she brought up the question about warming milk. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, okay, Darlene, now I understand your question. So Darlene is wondering when to start cold milk um, so that your baby gets accustomed to it. So it might not be a bad idea, and again, I would always put in the caveat to check with your pediatrician, but maybe when you start table foods, uh, we encourage exclusive breastfeeding with no added foods or other liquids for the first six months. So that's a conversation I would have with your pediatrician when you get ready to start solids and ask about if that's a time when it's okay to start warming or to start giving your baby milk that's a little bit colder. Um, let's say you're still putting the baby to the breast for that additional six months. Um, the guideline I think now is that after the first year, that's when most pediatricians will tell parents you can introduce whole milk, whole cow's milk, or whatever type of cold milk you're using. At that time, I would start giving right from the fridge in a sippy cup if you haven't already started doing that. Um, and just kind of take your baby's lead. Some babies adjust to that really quickly with no problems. Um, some babies have a thing about temperature or texture or maybe the milk they're drinking is fine but they don't like the cup. So it's a good idea to start introducing the cup maybe a couple of months before you, you're all done breastfeeding. Um, but I would get your pediatrician involved with that. Um, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, and you know, I have a child who, when she was really little, was a very picky eater. And, you know, kids are, kids are resilient and they learn pretty quickly. So if you just keep offering the milk at the temperature from the fridge and that's what they get, sooner or later, when they're thirsty, they'll drink it. Um, and it might be a little easier to do that because this is your second baby. Um, you're not going to have the extra time that someone would have with their first baby to do those extra things because you've got another child to take care of. And you may find that this baby is a lot more flexible and their personality is a little more go with the flow. So keep that in the back of your mind. I don't think you have to be too concerned about it just yet, but I would say when it's time to start introducing uh, regular whole milk or any other kind of almond milk or something like that, when you start full on table foods and you're weaning, that would be a good time to start giving them cold milk just so they get accustomed to it. Hope that answers your question. Sorry, it took me a long time to get, to figure out exactly what you were asking, but I appreciate you clarifying that for me. All right, any other questions, anything? Um, while we're waiting for some other questions to formulate, why don't we talk about uh, getting ready to go back to work. I know a lot of us are probably telecommuting. I'm not. I'm coming directly to work, but I'm also not breastfeeding. So for those of you who will be going back to work maybe the end of the summer, first part of September, let's talk about when you should start pumping and what to do when you get there. So about four weeks before you go back to work, that's a good time to start your pumping process. And uh, when I was answering another question earlier in the support group time, we were talking about when to pump. So after that very first feeding in the morning, pump and put that right in the freezer. And do this for a few days. You know, I like to start things on a Monday, so start on Monday. And after that first morning feeding, pump for 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then whatever you get, put that in the freezer. And you're gonna do this for several days, maybe three or four days. And as you do this, you may see that a pattern begins to emerge as far as when your baby's hungry, maybe when they take that afternoon nap, things might become a little more predictable. Um, so as you see those afternoon feeding patterns emerge, see if you, know, you can add in a pumping session in the afternoon. So let's say you start on Monday, you do this for three or four days, so Friday rolls around and you've been kind of paying attention to your baby's napping and feeding schedule and you figured out that, okay, well, my baby goes to sleep around one, but this is their long nap time and they're not gonna be up until four. So you can pump around two o'clock or three o'clock, somewhere in there, but the point is to do something in the afternoon. What we know about breastfeeding hormones is that they're very high in our bloodstream in the morning. And then as the day progresses, they go, 
they go down and there's a slump towards the afternoon, usually between you know, three and five o'clock, somewhere in there. So between the, that period of time is a good time to pump because instead of your milk, uh, your, your breastfeeding hormones going down this low, maybe they'll only be down here. So you can keep your levels elevated in the afternoon and then as the evening progresses, they'll start to rise and then you'll start you know, that early morning feeding with those high levels again. And that's something that you can continue to do for those four weeks until you go back to work. So by the time these four weeks are up, you will have been pumping a couple times, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Um, by the time maybe a week before you go back to work, you're gonna notice when your baby's gonna be ready to eat, maybe 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3, 4, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, somewhere in there. So when you go back to work, if you're working an eight-hour shift, I would try to pump around the same times that your baby would be normally eating at home. For an eight-hour shift, you're probably going to pump at least twice. For a 12-hour shift, you probably will be pumping three or four times. It just depends on your supply and what your body's doing. So if you happen to work at Southern Hills Hospital, I know I had a lot of moms that were participating in our prenatal class last week. There is a pumping room that we have right now and it's in the women's dressing room behind admitting. So when you come back to work, be sure that you have a conversation first with your charge nurse and with your unit manager about a week or two before you come back to work and work out a schedule that's gonna, you know, that will fit with the needs of the unit and the needs of your baby and your body. And then just time it so that you head down to that dressing room behind admitting um, for about 15 minutes, you know, two or three times a day. It just depends on what your body and your baby's needs are. And then be sure that you have enough of those reusable ice packs and be sure that you have a good insulated storage bag. If your break room has a fridge and there's room, you can put it in there, but I would have lots of breast milk storage, uh, not breast milk storage bags, but the reusable ice packs so that your milk can stay cold and it'll be good, especially going into summer. You wanna be sure that you control the temperature in that bag as much as, much as you can. We have two questions. Okay, two more questions. Um, What's the first one? Sarah says, I'm Hi, Sarah. Days postpartum. When I pump, I only get about a half to one ounce combined. Mm -hmm. Okay, congratulations, Sarah. She's got a two week old and she's wondering about how to increase her stash so that when she goes back to work, she's got lots at home already for her baby. That's a great question and that's perfect. I was just gonna start talking about that. So there are two ways that you can increase your breast milk supply. So if you guys aren't taking notes, now would be a good time to write it down or make a little text note on your phone and I'll have uh, Cindy put the instructions in the comments as well so that you'll be able to refer back, okay? And then if anyone has any follow-up questions after our session, we're gonna take maybe 20 more minutes worth of questions and then anything else, feel free to keep posting and I'll try and get back online this afternoon and answer as many of your questions as I can. Okay, so increasing your supply. These are methods of power pumping. Okay. The first method is uh, going to take place over a two-day period. In the evening, sometime between 5 and 8, what I want you to do is breastfeed your baby, and then I want you to get your pump set up, and I want you to cue up your favorite television programs if you're watching regular network television, or cue up your favorite uh, whatever show you're watching on Netflix right now, okay? So for network television, you're gonna start watching whatever the shows are. Every time there is a commercial, you pump. And then as soon as the commercial ends, you turn your pump off. And you're gonna repeat this process for two hours, okay? So every time there's a commercial, you're gonna pump, and then you're gonna rest while the program's actually on. You're gonna do this, let's say you do this tonight. So you're gonna do it Tuesday night, and then you're going to do it at about the same time again tomorrow night, Wednesday night. So start somewhere between 5 and 7 and then go for two hours. Pump during commercials and rest when the show is on. Now, if you're watching something on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, 
it can be a little bit trickier to know when those commercials are going to happen and how long they're going to last. We know that for network television and for network news, the adult attention span is about seven minutes, and commercials run anywhere from two to three minutes. And you might find that there's more commercials or more breaks towards the end of a newscast. You might find that there's a few more commercials towards the end of a program. So a good rule of thumb is to set your timer for seven minutes, start watching your show, and when the seven minutes are up, for about three minutes, you can pump. And then when the three minutes are up, set your timer again for seven minutes and queue up your show again. Now that might be a little bit tricky. Um, you might need a couple different timer settings. Um, you might have to play around with it a little bit, but you guys are smart people and I'm sure you'll figure it out. But it's a nice way to be productive while you're relaxing. Now, don't be surprised if you start getting really sleepy too because you're going to be doing all this pumping and you're going to be you know, bumping up your oxytocin and your prolactin levels and you might feel really sleepy. So at the end of this two hour period when your baby wakes up, go ahead and feed them and then you're probably going to be ready for a nice nap. Um, I see there's another question. I want to talk about the second power pumping method first and then we'll get to your next question. Okay? So the other way to power pump is something that you're going to do in the afternoon. And this, I think, can work especially well for families where there's more than one child. So in the afternoon, thinking about nap times, you put your baby down, maybe you've got a two- or three-year-old, and you've gotten nap times scheduled so that everybody goes down between one and two. So you're going to feed your baby, and then a couple of hours later, for one hour, this is the power pumping method you're going to implement. You're going to pump for 10 minutes, and then you're going to rest for 10 minutes, and then you're going to pump again for 10 minutes, and then you're going to rest for 10 minutes, and so on for one hour. Then you're going to repeat this process every afternoon, but if you start today, it's very important that you maintain this pattern for at least four or five days because it's going to take a while for your body to get accustomed to this increased demand in this new pattern, right? So stick it out, and you may not see results right away with either of these methods. It is okay to keep going with whichever method works for you until you're seeing a noticeable increase in your breast milk supply, okay? If I need to go over that again, one of you guys just let me know in the comments. And like I said, Cindy will put all that information up in the comments as well so you can go back and refer through. Okay, next question. Yes, um, Anna Anarelli. Um, Hi, Anarelli. Great. She's exclusively pumping though because she had issues with latching. Now mm -hmm. the baby's poop is dark green. She's worried okay. if it's just normal. Is her baby dehydrated? She's also worried maybe she's not eating enough. Okay. Tell me the, the question the person's name again. Anarelli. Okay. So Anarelli's concerned she's pumping exclusively. A lot of moms do that. That's still breastfeeding. And she's concerned because the baby's poop color is more of a dark green and um, she's concerned about supply, I think, as well. So my first question is, um, your baby's seven weeks old. Did you notice that the poop was kind of a yellow color, kind of mustard yellow before, and now it's green? Um, if not, the, and let's, was your baby also being supplemented? That might be something um, to consider as well. That's a question I would refer back to your pediatrician because with just the information that you've given me, I'm not quite sure exactly what the issue might be. Um, make sure that you are pumping at, for about 20 minutes um, each time that you pump and be sure that you're pumping at least every three hours. That works out to eight times every 24 hours. But for a seven week old, that might not be enough. So you might need to add in an, a couple of extra pumping sessions, maybe shoot for 12. Um, you also want to be sure that when you're pumping that you're, you're seeing um, the nice, uh, the, the transition from the fore milk to the hind milk. Um, the fore milk is um, lots of hydration. There's some protein and some carbohydrates in there, but the hind milk 
is where all the fat is. So think about if we're using a dairy metaphor, your fore milk is like non-fat or 1% milk, and the hind milk is like heavy cream. You want to be sure that you're getting the heavy cream into your pumping uh, container and that your baby gets that because that's, it needs that fat for brain and growth brain development and for growth. So be sure that you're emptying your breasts well and that it's looking nice and, and cloudy. You might even watch, um, if it sits out for a little bit, you'll see it separate and you'll see the fat kind of rise to the top. If you're not seeing that, you might want to extend your pump time. You might also want to talk with a pediatrician and maybe have a lactation consultant come to your home or at least do a one-on-one -on -one and talk with them a little bit more. Um, Green poop doesn't necessarily mean anything's wrong, and there's a whole range of green. If it's looking yellow at all and seedy, then it's entirely possible that this is normal for your baby. But again, I would probably get your pediatrician involved. Um, make sure your baby's gaining weight appropriately, and then make sure you're pumping sufficiently for enough time and enough times per day. Okay, I hope that answers your question. All right, folks, it's 11.45. So we've got about 15 more minutes of time that I'll